watching that film, what did you see in that film that was true for you? A lot. I'd, I'd love to say it's the first time I've heard the, the issues um, and barriers articulated by women in STEM, but it's not. These um, issues have been around for a very, very long time. And uh, there have been lots of studies and things done of um, barriers faced by women in STEM. And of course, we know it starts very, very early, as early as primary school. Um, and you see some of those barriers uh, right throughout women's careers. So when you hear things like, should I have a baby, it will be um, you know, detrimental to, to my career, I've never asked for a pay rise, um, it's way too familiar. The journey that some of those women took obviously was very, very important um, and uh, the leadership journey I think was reflected in many ways, um, not only through their personal leadership but the background of Antarctica and the importance of women being able to be in leadership positions uh, to address some of these global issues that require a different type of leadership because so far the sort of leadership we've seen hasn't addressed those um, bigger issues. So um, lots that was familiar. Um, and obviously told in a very, very engaging um, way through personal stories. What about you, Kylie? Uh, of what was it in the film that you went, oh, that's a little bit true for me? Uh, like Anna Maria, um, there was so much of it that unfortunately wasn't a surprise to me. Um, when I was uh, CEO of Science and Technology Australia, I established a program called the Superstars of STEM, which was aimed, uh, I, I guess, a little bit like Homeward Bound at empowering uh, women with the skills, the connections, the uh, opportunities to become very visible public role models and uh, working with a small group of women from across a diversity of STEM disciplines over a long period of time throughout many of the issues that uh, we saw in the film, not just for the women, but I also related a little bit to Fabian's journey, I have to say. I went into that very naively, establishing a program thinking I had all the answers, and clearly I didn't. And I learned as much from the women on that first program as I think they perhaps and hopefully learned as well. Um, and that has evolved that program over time. And I think one of the things that I continue to work on was that it's not... Uh, I, I think as was highlighted in the film, just about uh, empowering individual women and connecting women with each other and with opportunities. But to fix this thing, we've got to fix the system, we've got to fix the culture, and that is a much bigger piece of work. So you're saying it's a bigger piece of work. When this film was done, it was a few years ago, it was pre-pandemic times. We're talking about the obstacles. Are those obstacles greater in number, maybe a bit higher, given that we're in a pandemic. We'll start with you, Kylie. So there have been a number of uh, studies that have come out over the last six months that have been done very, very quickly to look at the effects of the COVID pandemic on academia and on women in STEM and academic STEM in particular. Unfortunately, what we've seen is that, as you might imagine, the increased pressure of the pandemic has exacerbated problems that were already there. The cracks are growing bigger. Um, women are overrepresented at junior levels in casual and other uncertain employment in STEM, in academic STEM in particular. Um, they are underrepresented at leadership and decision making levels and um, the inevitable almost has happened unfortunately that women have left STEM much quicker They've been much more, uh, much more impacted by job losses that have happened across academia than men have. Um, they've also been uh, denied access to the leadership table. Then there are some decisions being taken um, in good faith, I think, by organisations that are facing economic crisis, as many are at the moment. Um, and they include things like uh, employers deciding that extra maternity or parental leave on top of the, uh, the legislative requirement is no longer a necessary thing to have. Um, or that uh, childcare centres can be closed down to save money. So there have been some decisions made over the last six months that will impact on the next generation generations of women coming into um, academic research, unfortunately, and there is a small but very rapidly narrowing window now to act to stop that um, or to reverse it. So what needs to be done right now in that window? We need to ensure that both women and men who understand the um, importance of uh, an equitable and an, and an inclusive uh, network and a workforce in STEM are there at the decision-making table. So for example the, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne um, took a decision rather than shutting its childcare um, to instead 
increase the level of support for people who were parents who were working on, on their staff. Um, to going to the, the, um, the point of even sending our teachers aides to uh, the homes of people who were working um, from home and doing um, education for their children at home uh, when those children had special needs and would ordinarily have qualified for an aid in the, in the classroom. I mean, those sorts of steps are in some senses incredibly ordinary and in, in other senses really visionary and important. And, and those sorts of um, very conscious investments, I think, are absolutely necessary. Anna Maria, what have you seen as far as the impact of COVID on the obstacles that are already there for women in STEM? There's some evidence um, that's coming to the, f the fore now around women who were publishing um, less uh, than, than men during the pandemic. Um, and we saw during the movie the publish or perish phenomena, and that, that's alive and well. And again, that goes to needing to improve the system so that everybody can participate and uh, uh, create a research system that's inclusive. So when women are either leaving the workforce or not participating in a way that allows them to uh, be competitive for grants, uh, we don't just run the risk of losing a generation of researchers, we are losing a generation of researchers. Um, and that impact on the nation is enormous for a very, very long time. I, I go back to a really important framework that has been articulated through um, an initiative of both the Academy of Science and the Academy of Technology and Engineering, and that's a 10-year plan for women in STEM, and that was released almost two years ago. Um, and it outlines a framework on the sort of opportunities we need to create to uh, allow us, in a 10-year time, frame to get to gender equity. And there are six opportunities there, and I'll focus just on one because it's important in the COVID environment. Um, and one of those is leadership and accountability. Um, it's people in leadership positions, such as the head of the Walton Eliza Hall Institute, who are making decisions today to respond to COVID, to support women and other represented people. Um, accountability uh, that is attached to that leadership is absolutely critical. So those leaders who are accountable and who do see the economic value as well as um, moral imperative of supporting women in STEM will not just assist uh, the exit of, of these women, which will have a negative impact on the nation broadly, but will also see their own businesses and research organisations prosper. We're all looking for hope at the moment. As far as accountability goes, and as far as you mentioned that this strategy was put forward a couple of years ago, what is it that we know works? I'll, I'll use an example um, such as the uh, male champions of change. So that's a good one about leadership and accountability being hand in hand. So that's, that recognises that men are in uh, decision making ro roles mostly. Um, and they are the champions for change. So they're making changes that are good for their business, are good um, uh, to allow the participation of women, whether that's in the corporate world and women in industry or, or women in academia. But, but a range of things that assist um, women to move through those systemic barriers or remove those barriers. So we've seen um, you know, appointments to boards, they're, they're kind of the obvious ones, but um, we mentioned childcare. Uh, help me out here, Kylie, there's about a million of mine now that um, escaping. So I, I think, I mean, targets and quotas work and they're important, but we're looking at cultural change, social change, and we're looking at systemic change, and all of those things have to happen in a very conscious way. Programs like the Science in Australia Gender Equity Program, SAGE, um, has a very structural, logical approach to um, encouraging or, or, in fact, requiring its members to look very deeply into um, their own practices, their own outcomes, their own uh, approaches to gender equity within their STEM uh, schools. Um, and then thinking uh, with the guidance of experts, thinking about how they can make tr structural reform um, and setting targets so that they know that how to measure that reform and whether it's working. And then having points along that journey where they can reflect um, and decide whether they need to adjust what they're doing. So that very um, logical, structured approach to change is required. At the same time, we need programs like the Male Champions of Change where uh, good men, where genuine allies who are men, are very proactively visible in leading change for men as well. We need to ensure that men are involved in this conversation and that men are uh, contributing to the change and, and to the leadership um, around really what we're talking about is change for everybody. It's not 
a woman's problem, it is a people's problem. So we need to know that men are, for example, leaving loudly. They need to be obvious parents. So they need to, if they are parents, they need to be saying as they're leaving the, the workplace at three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to go and uh, visit my daughter's assembly because she's getting a prize and I want to be there and it's important to me. Not just to do it, but to tell people that they're doing it, to normalise it. I am taking parental leave with the birth of my child or the arrival of a child into my family. Not just to do it, but to tell people that they're doing it and they're proud to do it. That's really important. There are some really practical examples. Some institutions have done things like um, hire two to three mathematicians at once um, and required them to be women. So. Those uh, applicants go in with a completely different mindset. Then they know that the attitude of the leaders within that faculty or department is already different to what they may have experienced throughout their career, uh, are more likely to apply if successful, are then supported um, in an environment that already has the sort of culture and attitude that one would expect um, in, in any field of science or in, indeed in, in any field at all. And those sort of initiatives are getting real results. Um, we see that the burden of um, being a woman in a particular forum tends to ease when you get to about 32, 33% percent representation, so you don't always have to be the woman who is on the X, Y and Z committee. Um, and that's really important because it frees you up to do what you're damn good at and have been trained to do, and that's your research, and therefore participate and compete in that research um, process equally. I, I think it's also important to point out that it's not just about uh, having children. It's not just about having being a, a parent. That uh, the barriers exist for women regardless of their personal situation, regardless of their sexuality, their gender identity, their parental status, um, or their marital status. Those barriers exist. And so when you hear comments like the two male supervisors who were in this film talking about how, well, it's just the thing that you do, you're, you, you love it so much, you live it 24 7, and it, th there's an assumption that you're on, switched on all of the time and that your first priority is your work all of the time. Where's the balance in that? Where's the humanity in that? Or um, when you uh, are told that you, you can't you can't apply for a promotion or you can't ask for a pay rise, whether you're told explicitly or implicitly, you are told. If we have a culture um, where women are incredibly vulnerable, where they are going on field trips and thinking before they go on field trips, it's my responsibility to keep myself safe because I'm going into a, an environment with a small group of people, I'm in the minority where uh, you know, we might be drinking, we might be li sharing living quarters. I have to make sure that I keep myself safe. It is not actually her responsibility to keep herself safe. So that's where the culture change, I think, is absolutely desperately required. And Kylie, you're mentioning culture change there, and I'm going to quote, I think it was Meredith there who said, you know, it's, this is all great, but then we're back at work on Monday with Professor Joe Bloggs and he's still an asshole. Um, what is, there might be a lot of, and it could be, you know, it could be a person of colour having, you know, saying the same thing. What are your, what's your advice as both of you, women who are leaders in science, what's your advice to people who are finding themselves in that environment and they do need to go back to work after the public holiday on Tuesday and they've still got, Professor Arsehole as their boss, you know, how do they work their way through that? What's your advice? I think there are two things that are really vitally important. And one is, uh, or has been thrown um, into the open through the Me Too movement. One is speaking up, because the more people who speak up, the more we shine a light on the dirty little secrets and the dark little corners, um, the less likely there are to be those dark little corners. So shining the light's really important. Films like this are incredibly important, telling those personal stories and making it known that this is happening because as, if we can take the burden of shame away from the people who uh, have had crimes perpetrated against them and, and give the burden of shame to the person who has per perpetrated the crime, that's a really, really important step. So telling those stories is incredibly important. And I forget what I was going to say second. So. <laughs> no, but you sound great. <laughs> what about you, Anna Maria? It was such a clear theme in the movie. So many women said, gee, um, firstly, I haven't seen so many other female scientists, and that's terrible, but 
Um, this happened to me and I just really didn't speak about it anymore. Um, it was at least three or four times during the movie and, and it's absolutely right. I think um, there are allies within organisations. I think the more we speak about these things, we find them. It doesn't even have to be in a combative way. Often uh, speaking about these things with you know, confidence and uh, going forward to leadership and also uh, expecting and demanding more of that leadership and requiring that change forces a conversation and it forces some level of accountability within the leadership. It can't rest on that one individual fighting this world or this organisation. It needs to be cultural change, it needs to be systemic change and it needs to be widespread. Connection was the second point. Having that network of, of allies, that network of people who believe you, that network of people who you know you can whinge and moan and let off steam with um, and who you, you can go to for advice. And choosing that network really carefully and making sure that um, that network, um, that professional network is also your kind of own personal board of directors who you can go to to help, uh, who you know will give you um, respectful and trustworthy and honest guidance. Um, I, I've seen that happen over and over again for women in STEM. Having that network has been a really, really powerful um, way to get through and to build your own resilience because we can't all be resilient all of the time and I think often think actually that women in STEM are um, asked to call again and again on a much deeper well of resilience than many of their colleagues. Um, so there are going to be times where you're extra vulnerable and things are really, really difficult. Let the network help you and be your resilience. And that doesn't just have to happen at an institutional level. So we live in this wonderful democracy where any of us can write to the head of a funding um, agency or the Prime Minister or a minister or, um, you know, there, there's a terrific group um, uh, that the Academy of Science assists the Early and Mid-Career Research Forum. There are almost 5,000 early and mid-career researchers from across disciplines across the country. They are a dynamic group who advocate, come together, bring together their experience from across the nation, across disciplines. Um, and, and they have a real voice. So they're, they're, there's another connection or ally uh, for that um, age group, I guess, that career stage. Um, but it's not only that, you know, it, it's in some ways the basic rules of advocacy. A lot of our conversation here has tried to talk about well, what are the solutions, you know, what can we do? What was the difference that you noticed in these women from the start to the end? Um, I think it goes back to what you've both been saying was, and Sarah Shano articulated it, where she went, I was talking to some of the other women and I realised it can't just be me. I, I can't speak for all of the women but I do know that um, with some of them that I spoke to, is, there was this real sense of um, they were so used to feeling like they were the only ones that when they didn't have that um, network, they did kind of often internalise some of those problems and kind of go, oh, well, I'm having these problems at work, but, you know, because they're not really encouraged to see things in a gender or diversity kind of lens. You could definitely see and I could feel how much that community and how much joy there was actually between a lot of those women for actually making those kinds of connections and having fun yeah. and going to an amazing place. Wales. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Anna Maria and Kylie, when it comes to you know, encouraging leadership in science, is it important to you that it's coming from women and people who are scientists, does that make a difference? It absolutely needs to involve them and, and their voices need to be heard um, in that journey. So it's not always going to be women in science at that decision-making table, uh, but the journey forward, the steps that are taken, the policy, the procedure, whatever might come forward um, in an organisation to deal with a, a particular matter absolutely needs to be informed um, by people who have had that experience and in this case it's women in science but again other underrepresented groups I don't think as the head of an organisation I can pretend to know or understand every issue because I'm the head of that organisation um, there needs to be consultation there needs to be um, genuine um, inclusive processes to allow people's voices to be heard in a safe way. And just going back to what you said earlier, um, recognising that things can be happening in the room next door that you don't know and allowing that space for people to be able to come forward. And then as a leader, um, 
you know, incorporating a level of transparency and communication that allows people to feel safe, um, but also doesn't sweep things under the table. I see you smiling and nodding, Kylie, and I'm dying to know what's going through your mind. I was thinking about, you know, that uh, paternalistic model of sweeping in and fixing it for everyone, you know. You can't do it that way. You do need to um, to make this from the grassroots, but you also, you need it at all levels, I think, because you need to have the clout as well. You need to have the oomph to be able to make that systemic change. So that requires the involvement of people at the top as well as people at all other levels in the system and, and people who are aspiring to be part of the system as well. Um, and Anna-Marie and I are, are currently at the very beginning of a, a very humbling journey, I think, to support uh, a group of people who are seeking to create a, an Indigenous STEM association, the first multidisciplinary Indigenous STEM association um, in Australia, which will be an incredibly important moment. But um, one of the, um, the absolute joys of, uh, of just starting to step down that road is that it's not ours. Um, we can, we can, and will give advice where it's where it's asked for, but um, and we'll give support in whatever way we can. But it's not our journey. I, some of my staff members are in this audience, um, so they'll be able to relate to this. What what perhaps might have been referred to earlier in in previous times as oversharing um, <laughs> is, from where I'm sitting, a an attempt to be genuinely transparent. And inclusive with um, with staff, and my entire career experience has been that that's been received really positively, and um, I, I, you know respect has been gained through that, and a participation and inclusiveness has been gained through that, and kind of at a macro level, we've seen it with the response to COVID nineteen by national leaders. Uh, female leadership has come in with different traits and different approaches that works. Um, some usually value driven, uh, usually involving a high level of communication, um, usually admitting to error. Uh, th so those sort of things are, are really, I think, important traits of leadership um, that perhaps previously were seen as weaknesses. The fact that um, Anna, Maria and I have been appointed to lead the two science academies in Australia, I think provides a little bit of hope for two reasons. Um, one is that we are much younger than the average age of the fellows who we who we work with, um, the the fellowship of the academies are you know the best of the best in the in the STEM fields in Australia, um, and you know many of them have worked for many many years before they reach that status. So um, they are necessarily uh, an older age group. They are also because of the profile of STEM uh, a mostly male aid, uh, mostly male cohort, but also that we are both actually known for being quite vocal on these issues, and we. Are not shy, neither of us. Um, I think that speaks volumes in terms of the, the hope and the intentions that the leadership, um, and I'm talk talking here about the boards of those organisations, have for STEM. They have that hope for their networks. And, and between us, we represent um, about 1,200, I think, of the leading scientists, technologists, engineers and mathematicians in Australia, and we have an extraordinary opportunity um, to bring those people along on a journey to make fundamental systemic change that will affect the future. Um, for me, that's one of my most powerful motivations in being in this job, and if we can start small by asking them to watch films like this um, and asking them to hear and see and understand um, and step into the shoes, I think, of people who are not like them for a little while, um, I think we can we can start to make some headway. Just to add to that, um, the fellows who Kylie's referred to are the, the distinguished scientists and technologists of the nation. And I started in this role um, almost four years ago. Um, and I've, I've been really pleasantly surprised, I guess. Uh, I have seen their journey um, being taken in a very authentic way, not because they think, oh, gee, I should, because everybody's talking about it and I'll look a little bit silly or for whatever reason. There have been genuine demonstrations and action that has been, um, that they have initiated as older scientists in leadership positions that I know 
six, seven years ago would not have crossed their mind. So there is an evolution happening. Um, it's, it's slow, but I feel really, really encouraged that particularly some of that older cohort are starting to take those steps voluntarily um, and looking at things through a very different lens. We'll end on that encouraging note. Please thank our panel, Anna Maria, Kylie and Illy.